Hello there, and welcome to tonight's episode of Down to Sleep. You're listening to the YouTube version of my podcast, which is a weekly reading of books and bedtime stories to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free on Spotify or other podcast apps every week, or join me on Patreon for two episodes a week, including access to every single reading I've done so far and completed audiobooks. Thank you so much for joining me. You can find the links to those things below this video. But for now, I think you're here to get down to sleep tonight. So let's go ahead and hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to this channel if you would like to hear more readings. And we'll begin. Once upon a time, in a far off country, there lived a merchant who had been so fortunate in all his undertakings that he was enormously rich. As he had six sons and six daughters, however, who were accustomed to having everything they fancied. He did not find that he had a penny too much. But misfortunes befell them. One day, their house caught fire and speedily burned to the ground. With all the splendid furniture, books, pictures, gold, silver, and precious goods that it contained. The father suddenly lost every ship that he had upon the sea either by dint of pirates, shipwreck, or fire. Then he heard that his clerks in distant countries, whom he had trusted entirely, had proved unfaithful. And at last, from great wealth, he fell into the direst poverty. All that he had left was a little house in a desolate place, at least a hundred leagues from the town. And to this he was forced to retreat. His children were in despair at the idea of leading such a different life. The daughters at first hoped their friends, who had been so numerous while they were rich, would insist on their staying in their houses. But they soon found they were left alone. Their former friends even attributed their misfortunes to their own extravagance and showed no intention of offering them any help so nothing was left for them but to take their departure to the cottage, which stood in the midst of a dark forest and seemed to be the most dismal place on the face of the earth. As they were too poor to have any servants, the girls had to work hard, and the sons, for their part, cultivated the fields to earn their living. Roughly clothed and living in the simplest way, the girls regretted unceasingly the luxuries and amusements of their former life. Only the youngest daughter tried to be brave and cheerful. She had been as sad as anyone when misfortune first overtook their father, but soon recovering her natural gaiety, she set to work to make the best of things, to amuse her father and brothers as well as she could and to persuade her sisters to join her in dancing and singing. But they would do nothing of the sort. Because she was not as doleful as themselves, they declared this miserable life was all she was fit for. But she was really far prettier and cleverer than they were. Indeed, she was so lovely, she was always called Beauty. After two years, when they were all beginning to get used to their new life, their father received news that one of his ships, which he had believed lost, had come safely into port with a rich cargo. All the sons and daughters at once thought their poverty was at an end, and wanted to set out directly for the town, but their father, who was more prudent, begged them to wait a little. And though it was harvest time and he could ill be spared, determined to go himself to make inquiries. Only the youngest daughter had any doubt that they would soon again be as rich as they were before. They all loaded their father with commissions for jewels and dresses which it would have taken a fortune to buy. Only Beauty, feeling sure it was of no use, did not ask for anything. Her father, noticing her silence, said, and what shall I bring for you, beauty? The only thing I wish for is to see you come home safely, she answered. But this reply vexed her sisters, who fancied she was blaming them for having asked for such costly things. Her father, however, was pleased. As he thought that at her age she certainly ought to like pretty presents, he told her to choose something. 
Well, dear father, she said, as you insist upon it, I beg that you will bring me a rose. I have not seen one since we came here, and I love them so much. The merchant reached town as quickly as possible, only to find that his former companions, believing him to be dead, had divided his cargo between them. After six months of trouble and expense, he found himself as poor as when he started on his journey. To make matters worse, he was obliged to return in the most terrible weather. By the time he was within a few leagues of his home, he was almost exhausted with cold and fatigue. Though he knew it would take some hours to get through the forest, he resolved to go on. But night overtook him and the deep snow and the bitter frost made it impossible for his horse to carry him any farther. Not a house was to be seen. The only shelter he could get was the hollow trunk of a great tree, and there he crouched all the night, which seemed to him the longest that he had ever known. The howling of the wolves kept him awake, and when at last day broke, the falling snow had covered every path, and he did not know which way to turn. At length he made out some sort of path, but it was so rough and slippery that he fell down more than once. Presently it led him into an avenue of trees which ended in a splendid castle. It seemed to the merchant very strange that no snow had fallen in the avenue of orange trees covered with flowers and fruit. When he reached the first court of the castle, he saw before him a flight of agate steps. He went up them and passed through several splendidly furnished rooms. The pleasant warmth of the air revived him, and he felt very hungry, but there seemed to be nobody in all this vast and splendid palace. Deep silence reigned everywhere. And at last, tired of roaming through empty rooms and galleries, he stopped in a room smaller than the rest, where a clear fire was burning and a couch was drawn up cosily before it. Thinking this must be prepared for someone who was expected, he sat down to wait till he should come, and very soon fell into a sweet sleep. When his extreme hunger wakened him after several hours, he was still alone. But a little table with a good dinner on it had been drawn up close to him. He lost no time in beginning his meal, hoping he might soon thank his considerate host, whoever it may be. But no one appeared, and even after another long sleep from which he awoke completely refreshed, there was no sign of anybody. Though a fresh meal of dainty cakes and fruit was prepared upon the little table at his elbow. Because he was naturally timid, the silence began to terrify him, and he resolved to search once more through all the rooms. But it was of no use, there was no sign of life in the palace. He wondered what he should do to amuse himself. He began pretending that all the treasures he saw were his own, considering how he would divide them among his children. Then he went down into the garden. And though it was winter everywhere else, here the sun shone, the birds sang, the flowers bloomed, and the air was soft and sweet. The merchant, in ecstasies with all he saw and heard, said to himself, All this must be meant for me. I will go this minute and bring my children to share all these delights. In spite of being so cold and weary, when he reached the castle, he had taken his horse to the stable and fed it. Now he thought he would saddle it for his homeward journey, and he turned down the path which led to the stable. This path had a hedge of roses on each side of it, and the merchant thought he had never seen such exquisite flowers. They reminded him of his promise to beauty, and he stopped and had just gathered one to take to her when he was startled by a strange noise behind him. Turning round, he saw a frightful beast, which seemed to be very angry and said in a terrible voice, Who told you you might gather my roses? 
Was it not enough that I sheltered you in my palace and was kind to you? This is the way you show your gratitude by stealing my flowers. Your insolence shall not go unpunished. The merchant, terrified by these furious words, dropped the fatal rose. Throwing himself on his knees, he cried, Pardon me, noble sir, I am truly grateful for your hospitality, which was so magnificent I could not imagine you would be offended by my taking such a little thing as a rose. But the beast's anger was not lessened by his speech. You are very ready with excuses and flattery, he cried, but that will not save you from the death you deserve. Alas, thought the merchant, if my daughter Beauty could only know into what danger her rose has brought me. And in despair he began to tell the beast all his misfortunes, the reason for his journey, not forgetting to mention Beauty's request. A king's ransom would hardly have procured all that my other daughters asked for, he said, but I thought I might at least take Beauty a rose. I beg you to forgive me, for you see I meant no harm. The beast said in a less furious tone, I will forgive you on one condition, that you will give me one of your daughters. Ah, cried the merchant, if I were cruel enough to buy my own life at the expense of one of my children's, what excuse could I invent to bring her here? None, answered the beast. If she comes at all, she must come willingly. On no other condition will I have her. See if any of them is courageous enough and loves you enough to come and save your life. You seem to be an honest man, so I will trust you to go home. I give you a month to see if any of your daughters will come back with you and stay here to let you go free. If none of them is willing, you must come alone after bidding them goodbye forever, for then you will belong to me. And do not imagine that you can hide from me, for if you fail to keep your word, I will come and fetch you, added the beast grimly. The merchant accepted this proposal, though he did not really think that any of his daughters would be persuaded to come. He promised to return at the time appointed, and Anxious to escape from the presence of the beast, he asked permission to set off at once. But the beast answered he could not go until the next day. Then you will find a horse ready for you, he said. Now go and eat your supper and await my orders. The poor merchant, more dead than alive, went back to his room, where the most delicious supper was already served on a little table drawn up before a blazing fire. But he was too terrified to eat and only tasted a few of the dishes for fear the beast should be angry if he did not obey his orders. When he had finished, he heard a great noise in the next room which he knew meant that the beast was coming. As he could do nothing to escape his visit, the only thing that remained was to seem as little afraid as possible. So when the beast appeared and asked roughly if he had supped well, the merchant answered humbly that he had, thanks to his host's kindness. Then the beast warned him to remember their agreement and to prepare his daughter exactly for what she had to expect. Do not get up tomorrow, he added, until you see the sun and hear a golden bell ring. Then you will find your breakfast waiting for you and the horse that you were to ride will be ready in the courtyard. He will also bring you back again when you come with your daughter a month hence. Farewell. Take a rose to beauty and remember your promise. The merchant lay down until the sun rose. After breakfast, he went to gather Beauty's rose and mounted his horse, which carried him off so swiftly that in an instant he had lost sight of the palace. He was still wrapped in gloomy thoughts when the horse stopped before the door of his cottage. His sons and daughters, who had been uneasy at his long absence, rushed to meet him, eager to know the results of his journey, which, seeing him mounted upon a splendid horse and wrapped in a rich mantle, they supposed to be favourable. 
But he hid the truth from them at first, only saying sadly to Beauty as he gave her the rose. Here is what you asked me to bring you. Little you know what it has cost. But this excited their curiosity so greatly that presently he told them his adventures from beginning to end. And then they were all very unhappy. The girls lamented loudly over their lost hopes, and the sons declared their father should not return to the terrible castle, and began to make plans for killing the beast if it should come to fetch him. But he reminded them he had promised to go back. Then the girls were very angry with Beauty and said it was all her fault. If she had asked for something sensible, this would never have happened. Poor Beauty, much distressed, said to them, I have indeed caused this misfortune, but who could have guessed that to ask for a rose in the middle of summer would cause so much misery? But as I did the mischief, it is only just that I should suffer for it. I will therefore go back with my father to keep his promise. At first, nobody would hear of it. Her father and brothers who loved her dearly declared nothing should make them let her go. But beauty was firm. As the time drew near, she divided her little possessions between her sisters and said goodbye to everything she loved. When the fatal day came, she encouraged and cheered her father as they mounted together the horse which had brought him back. It seemed to fly rather than gallop, but so smoothly that Beauty was not frightened indeed she would have enjoyed the journey, if she had not feared what might happen at the end of it. Her father still tried to persuade her to go back, but in vain. While they were talking, night fell. Then, to their great surprise, wonderful colored lights began to shine in all directions, and splendid fireworks blazed out before them. All the forest was illuminated. They even felt pleasantly warm, though it had been bitterly cold before. They reached the avenue of orange trees and saw that the palace was brilliantly lighted from roof to ground and music sounded softly from the courtyard. The beast must be very hungry, said Beauty, trying to laugh, if he makes all this rejoicing over the arrival of his prey. But in spite of her anxiety, she admired all of the wonderful things she saw. When they had dismounted, her father led her to the little room that he had been in before. Here they found a splendid fire burning, and the table daintily spread with a delicious supper. The merchant knew that this was meant for them, and Beauty, who was less frightened now that she had passed through so many rooms and seen nothing of the beast, was quite willing to begin, for her long ride had made her very hungry. They had hardly finished their meal when the noise of the beast's footsteps was heard approaching. Beauty clung to her father in terror, which became all the greater when she saw how frightened he was. But when the beast really appeared, though she trembled at the sight of him, she made a great effort to hide her horror and saluted him respectfully. This evidently pleased the beast. After looking at her, he said in a tone that might have struck terror into the boldest heart, though he did not seem to be angry. Good evening, old man. Good evening, Beauty. The merchant was too terrified to reply, but Beauty answered sweetly. Good evening, beast. Have you come willingly? asked the beast. Will you be content to stay here when your father goes away? Beauty answered bravely that she was quite prepared to stay. I am pleased with you, said the beast. As you have come of your own accord, you may remain. As for you, old man, he added, turning to the merchant, at sunrise tomorrow you take your departure, 
When the bell rings, get up quickly and eat your breakfast, and you will find the same horse waiting to take you home. But remember, you must never expect to see my palace again. Turning to Beauty, he said, Take your father into the next room and help him choose gifts for your brothers and sisters. You will find two traveling trunks there. Fill them as full as you can. It is only just that you should send them something very precious as remembrance. He went away after saying, Goodbye, Beauty. Goodbye, old man. Beauty was beginning to think with great dismay of her father's departure. But she was afraid to disobey the beast's orders. They went into the next room, which had shelves and cupboards all around it. They were greatly surprised at the riches that it contained. There were splendid dresses fit for a queen with all the ornaments to be worn with them. When Beauty opened the cupboard, she was dazzled by the gorgeous jewels lying in heaps upon every shelf. After choosing a vast quantity which she had divided between her sisters, she had made the heap of wonderful dresses for each of them, she opened the last chest, which was full of gold. I think, father, she said, that as the gold will be more useful to you, we had better take out the other things and fill the trunks with it. So they did this. But the more they put in, the more room there seemed to be, and at last they put back all the jewels and dresses that they had taken out. And Beauty even added as many more of the jewels as she could carry at once. Even when the trunks were not too full, but they were so heavy an elephant could not have carried them. The beast was mocking us, cried the merchant. He pretended to give us all these things, knowing I could not carry them away. Let us wait and see, answered Beauty. I cannot believe that he meant to deceive us. All we can do is fasten them up and have them ready. So they did this and returned to the little room where, to their astonishment, they found breakfast ready. The merchant ate with his good appetite as the beast's generosity made him believe he might perhaps venture to come back soon and see Beauty. But she felt sure that her father was leaving her forever. So she was very sad when the bell rang sharply for the second time and warned them that the time was come for them to part. They went down into the courtyard where two horses were waiting, one loaded with the two trunks, the other for him to ride. They were pouring the ground in their impatience to start and the merchant bade Beauty a hasty farewell. As soon as he was mounted, he went off at such a pace she lost sight of him in an instant. Then Beauty began to cry, and wandered sadly back to her own room. But she soon found that she was very sleepy, and as she had nothing better to do, she lay down and instantly fell asleep. She dreamed she was walking by a brook bordered with trees, lamenting her sad fate, when a young prince, handsomer than anyone that she had ever seen, and with a voice that went straight to her heart, came and said to her, Beauty, you are not so unfortunate as you suppose. Here you will be rewarded for all you have suffered elsewhere. Your every wish shall be gratified. Only try to find me out, no matter how I may be disguised, for I love you dearly. And in making me happy, you will find your own happiness. Be as true-hearted as you are beautiful. We shall have nothing else left to wish for. What can I do, Prince, to make you happy? said Beauty. Only be grateful, he answered and do not trust too much to your eyes. Above all, do not desert me until you have saved me from my cruel misery. After this, she thought she found herself in a room with a stately and beautiful lady who said to her, Dear Beauty, try not to regret all that you have left behind you. You are destined for a better fate. Only do not let yourself be deceived by appearances. 
Beauty found her dreams so interesting that she was in no hurry to awake, but presently the clock roused her by calling her name softly, twelve times. Then she rose and found her dressing table set out with everything she could possibly want. She found dinner waiting in the room next to hers, but dinner does not take very long when one is alone, and very soon she sat down cosily in the corner of a sofa and began to think about the charming prince that she had seen in her dream. He said I could make him happy, said Beauty to herself. It seems then that this horrible beast keeps him a prisoner. How can I set him free? I wonder why they both told me not to trust appearances, but after all it was only a dream, so why should I trouble myself about it? I had better find something to do to amuse myself. She began to explore some of the many rooms of the palace. The first she entered was lined with mirrors. Beauty saw herself reflected on every side and thought she had never seen such a charming room. Then a bracelet which was hanging from a chandelier caught her eye. And on taking it down she was greatly surprised to find that it held a portrait of her unknown admirer, just as she had seen in her dream. With great delight, she slipped the bracelet on her arm and went into a gallery of pictures, where she soon found a portrait of the same handsome prince, as large as life and so well painted that as she studied it, he seemed to smile kindly at her. Tearing herself away from the portrait at last, she passed into a room which contained every musical instrument under the sun. Here she amused herself for a long while trying them, singing until she was tired. The next room was a library, and she saw everything she had ever wanted to read as well as everything that she had read. By this time it was growing dusk, and wax candles in diamond and ruby candlesticks lit themselves in every room. Beauty found her supper served just at the time she preferred to have it. She did not see anyone or hear a sound, Though her father had warned her she would be alone, she began to find it rather dull. Presently, she heard the beast coming, and wondered tremblingly if he meant to eat her now. However, he did not seem at all ferocious, and only said gruffly, Good evening, beauty. She answered cheerfully and managed to conceal her terror. The beast asked how she had been amusing herself. She told him all the rooms that she had seen. Then he asked if she thought she could be happy in his palace. Beauty answered that everything was so beautiful she would be very hard to please if she could not be happy. After about an hour's talk, Beauty began to think the beast was not nearly so terrible as she had supposed at first. Then he rose to leave her, and said in a gruff voice, Do you love me, beauty? Will you marry me? Oh, what shall I say, cried beauty. She was afraid to make the beast angry by refusing. Say yes, or no, without fear, he replied. Oh, no, beast, said beauty hastily. Since you will not. Good night, beauty. She answered, Good night, beast. Very glad to find her refusal had not provoked him. After he was gone, she was very soon in bed and dreaming of her unknown prince. She thought that he came and said, Beauty, why are you so unkind to me? I fear I am fated to be unhappy for many a long day still. Her dreams changed, but the charming prince figured in them all. When morning came, her first thought was to look at the portrait and see if it really was him. She found it certainly was. She decided to amuse herself in the garden, for the sun shone and all the fountains were playing. She was astonished to find that every place was familiar to her. Presently, she came to the very brook and the myrtle trees where she had first met the prince in her dream. 
That made her think more than ever that he must be kept a prisoner by the beast. When she was tired, she went back to the palace and found a new room, full of materials for every kind of work. Ribbons to make into bows and silks to work into flowers. There was an aviary full of birds, rare birds which were so tame that they flew to beauty as soon as they saw her, perched upon her shoulders and her head. Pretty little creatures, she said. How I wish your cage was nearer my room that I might often hear you sing. So saying, she opened a door and found to her delight it led into her own room, though she had thought that it was on the other side of the palace. There were more birds in a room further on, parrots, cockatoos that could talk, and they greeted Beauty by name. Indeed, she found them so entertaining that she took one or two back to her room. They talked to her while she was at supper. The beast paid her his usual visit and asked the same questions as before, and with a gruff good night took his departure. Beauty went to bed to dream of her mysterious prince. The days passed swiftly in different amusements, and after a while Beauty found another strange thing in the palace, which often pleased her when she was tired of being alone. There was one room which she had not noticed particularly. It was empty except that under each of the windows stood a very comfortable chair. The first time she had looked out the window it seemed a black curtain prevented her from seeing anything outside. But the second time she went into the room, happening to be tired, she sat down in one of the chairs, when instantly the curtain was rolled aside, and a most amusing pantomime was acted before her. There were dances and coloured lights, music, and pretty dresses, and it was all so gay that Beauty was in ecstasies. After that, she tried the other seven windows in turn. There was some new and surprising entertainment to be seen from each of them, so Beauty could never feel lonely anymore. Every evening after supper, the Beast came to see her, and always before saying goodnight, asked her in his terrible voice, Beauty, Will you marry me? And it seemed to Beauty now that she understood him better, that when she said, No beast, he went away quite sad. Her happy dreams of the handsome young prince soon made her forget the poor beast, and the only thing that disturbed her was being told to distrust appearances, to let her heart guide her, not her eyes. Consider as she would, she could not understand. So everything went on, for a long time, until at last, happy as she was, Beauty began to long for the sight of her father, for her brothers and sisters. One night, seeing her look very sad, the beast asked her what was the matter. Beauty had quite ceased to be afraid of him. Now she knew he was really gentle, in spite of his ferocious looks and his dreadful voice. So she answered, she wished to see her home once more. Upon hearing this, the beast seemed sadly distressed and cried miserably. Beauty, have you the heart to desert an unhappy beast like this? What more do you want to make you happy? Is it because you hate me that you want to escape? No, oh, dear beast, answered Beauty softly do not hate you, and I should be very sorry never to see you any more, but I long to see my father again. Only let me go for two months and I promise to come back to you and stay for the rest of my life. The beast, who had been sighing dolefully while she spoke, replied, I cannot refuse you anything you ask, even though it should cost me my life. Take the four boxes you will find in the room next to your own and fill them with everything you wish to take with you. But remember your promise and come back when the two months are over. Or you may have cause to repent it, for if you do not come in good time, you will find your faithful beast dead. You will not need any chariot to bring you back. 
Only say goodbye to all your brothers and sisters the night before you come away, and when you have gone to bed, turn this ring round upon your finger and say firmly, I wish to go back to my palace and see my beast again. Good night, beauty. Fear nothing. Sleep peacefully. Before long you shall see your father once more. As soon as Beauty was alone, she hastened to fill the boxes with all the rare and precious things she saw about her, and only when she was tired of heaping things into them did they seem to be full. She went to bed but could hardly sleep for joy, when at last she began to dream of her beloved prince. She was grieved to see him stretched upon a grassy bank, sad and weary, hardly like himself. What's the matter, she cried. But he looked at her reproachfully and said, How can you ask me, cruel one? Are you not leaving me to my death, perhaps? Don't be so sorrowful, cried Beauty. I am only going to assure my father I'm safe and happy. I've promised the beast faithfully that I will come back, and he would die of grief if I did not keep my word. What would that matter to you? asked the prince. Surely you would not care. Indeed, I should be ungrateful if I did not care for such a kind beast, cried Beauty indignantly. I would die to save him from pain. I assure you it is not his fault that he is so ugly. Just then, a very strange sound awoke her. Someone was speaking not very far away, and opening her eyes she found herself in a room that she had not seen before. It was certainly not as splendid as those that she had seen in the beast's palace. Where could she be? She rose and dressed hastily and saw that the boxes she packed the night before were all in the room. Suddenly she heard her father's voice and rushed out to greet him joyfully. Her brothers and sisters were astonished at her appearance for they had never expected to see her again. It was no end to the questions that they asked her. She also had much to hear about what had happened to them while she was away and of her father's journey home. When they heard that she had only come back to be with them for a short time and must go back to the beast's palace forever, they lamented loudly. Beauty asked her father what he thought of her strange dreams, why the prince constantly begged her not to trust appearances. After much consideration he answered, you tell me yourself, the beast, frightful as he is, loves you dearly and deserves your love and gratitude for his gentleness and kindness. I think the prince must mean you to understand that you ought to reward him by doing as he wishes. In spite of his ugliness, Beauty could not help seeing that this seemed probable. Still, when she thought of her dear prince who was so handsome, she did not feel at all inclined to marry the beast. At any rate, she need not decide for two months. She could instead enjoy herself with her sisters, but though they were rich now and lived in a town again and had plenty of acquaintances, she often thought of the palace, where she was so happy, especially as at home she never once dreamed of her dear prince. She felt quite sad without him. Her sisters seemed quite used to being without her and even found her rather in the way, so she would not have been sorry when the two months were over, but for her father and brothers who begged her to stay, and seemed so grieved at the thought of her departure, she had not the courage to say goodbye to them. Every day when she rose she meant to say at night, and when night came she put it off again, till at last she had a dismal dream which helped her make up her mind. She thought she was wandering in a lonely path in the palace gardens, when she heard groans that seemed to come from bushes hiding the entrance of a cave. Running quickly to see what could be the matter, she found the beast stretched out upon his side, apparently dying. He reproached her faintly, with being the cause of his distress, and at the same moment a stately lady appeared and said gravely, Beauty, see what happens when people do not keep their promises. 
If you had delayed one more day, you would have found him dead. Beauty was so terrified by this dream that the next morning she announced her intention of going back at once. That very evening she said goodbye to her father, her brothers, her sisters, and as soon as she was in bed she turned her ring upon her finger and said firmly, I wish to go back to my palace and see my beast again. She fell asleep instantly and only woke up to hear the clock saying, Beauty, Beauty, twelve times in its musical voice, which told her she was really in the palace once more. Everything was just as before. Her birds were so glad to see her, but Beauty thought she had never known such a long day. She was so anxious to see the beast again that she felt as if supper time would never come. But when it came, no beast appeared. After listening and waiting for a long time, she ran down into the garden to search for him. Up and down the paths and avenues ran poor Beauty, calling him no one answered. Not a trace of him could she find. At last, quite tired, she stopped for a minute's rest and saw she was standing opposite the shady path that she had seen in her dream. She rushed down and sure enough there was a cave, and in it lay the beast, asleep, or so Beauty thought. Quite glad to have found him, she ran up and stroked his head, but to her horror, he did not move or open his eyes. He is dead. And it's all my fault, cried Beauty, crying bitterly. Looking at him again, she fancied that he still breathed. Hastily fetching some water from the nearest fountain, she sprinkled it over his face. And to her great delight, he began to revive. Beast, how you frightened me, she cried. I, I never knew how much I loved you until just now, when I feared I was too late to save your life. Can you really love such an ugly creature as I am? Asked the beast faintly. Beauty, you, you, you came only just in time. I was dying because I thought that you had forgotten your promise. But go back now and rest, I shall see you again. Beauty, who had half expected he would be angry with her, was reassured by his gentle voice and went back to the palace, where supper was awaiting her. Afterwards, the beast came in as usual and talked about the time she spent with her father, asking if she enjoyed herself, if they had all been glad to see her. Beauty quite enjoyed telling him all that had happened to her. When at last the time came for him to go, he asked, as he had so often asked before, Beauty, will you marry me? She answered softly, Yes, dear beast. As she spoke, a blaze of light sprang up before the windows of the palace. Fireworks crackled and guns banged. Across the avenue of orange trees in letters all made of fireflies was written, Long live the prince and his bride. Turning to ask the beast what it could all mean, Beauty found that he had disappeared. In his place stood her long-loved prince. At the same moment, the wheels of a chariot were heard upon the terrace, and two ladies entered the room. One of them Beauty recognized as the stately lady that she had seen in her dreams. The other was so queenly that Beauty hardly knew which to greet first. But the one she already knew said to her companion, Well, queen, this is Beauty, who has had the courage to rescue your son from the terrible enchantment. They love each other, and only your consent to their marriage is wanting to make them perfectly happy. I consent with all my heart, cried the queen. How can I ever thank you enough, charming girl, for having restored my dear son to his natural form? She tenderly embraced Beauty and the prince, who had meanwhile been greeting the fairy and receiving her congratulations. Now, said Fairy to the beauty, I suppose you would like me to send for all your brothers and sisters to dance at your wedding? So she did, and the marriage was celebrated 
the very next day with the utmost splendor. Beauty and the prince lived happily ever after. The end. And that is where we close the book on tonight's episode and on Beauty and the Beast as that is a full and complete reading of this book. <laughs>